on World News Tonight. Race for impact. Pakistan prepares for the worst with cyclone because Joy's landfall being imminent. Back in the pack. The United States amends broken bonds with UNESCO in the effort for further multilateralism. Unending terror. Sudan erupts into violence yet again following the expiry of the conflict truce. And purple power. South Korea celebrates the decade of tasteful music and rhythm brought to the world by BTS. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening to all our viewers and you are watching World News Tonight. A deep depression over the Southeast Arabian Sea rapidly intensified into a very serious cyclone storm with our joy in the last few days. Preparations were underway in Pakistan for a storm building off its southern coast, which weather authorities say has strengthened to become a powerful cyclone and could make landfall this week. Fishermen say that authorities had stopped issuing fishing permits and boats at sea had been recalled. Kamal Shan, a spokesperson from the Pakistan Fisher Fork Forum, said degraded mangrove forests near beaches in Karachi would increase the impact of a cyclone and warned Pakistan's largest city could suffer substantial damage in a short space of time. The cyclone will also affect neighboring India's west coast with a dozen districts in coastal Gujarat predicted to be affected by heavy rainfall and gusting winds, according to a weather official who had declined to be named. Flooding struck in the provinces of Granma, Las Tunas, Santiago de Cuba and Canagüe after heavy rain from 8th to 9th of June 2023. The Meteorological Department of Cuba reported 360 millimeters of rain in 24 hours to the 9th of June in Bartolome, Maso and 280.3 millimeters in Yiguani, both in Granma province. Tonight, a flooding emergency in Cuba turns deadly. Raging water sweeping through homes, leaving communities underwater, thousands evacuated and at least one person killed. The military using helicopters in some areas to rescue families, including women and children. They warned us before, but we didn't want to leave. And now we had to get out, said this man after he boarded one of the military helicopters. Others, like this elderly couple, rescued on boats from their homes. Cuba's central and eastern areas are the most affected after a weekend of heavy rain causing rivers to overflow. Over 400 rural communities affected by the flooding. We're trying to save everything we can while helping neighbors, said this man. Official media reporting some 10,000 homes have been damaged. And more than 7,000 people have been evacuated. Days of rain have left the ground saturated with water with dams at capacity. And the forecast indicating more rain may come in a country where the needs are overwhelming. Uh, lack of food, lack of medicine. Lack of gasoline, which affects aid to any part of, of the country right now. The flooding already damaging over 2,000 acres of crops, including fruits and vegetables, vital to help with those food shortages. Add a disaster such as flooding or hurricanes, and it becomes almost uh, unbearable for the Cuban people right now. Many bracing for another tough year, with a new hurricane season just beginning. Amid the ongoing Seoul-Beijing diplomatic tension, Seoul stop of office has expressed concerns over the controversial remarks by China's ambassador to South Korea with Beijing hitting back. A senior White House official weighed in saying South Korea has every right to make its own foreign policy decisions. South Korea is a sovereign, independent nation that has the right to make foreign policy decisions that it deems appropriate. That's according to White House National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby, speaking about China's ambassador to South Korea, Xin Haiming, who said last week that it would be wrong for Seoul to bet on Beijing's defeat, apparently criticizing South Korea's foreign policy leaning towards the U.S. In a press briefing on Monday U.S. local time, the senior White House official also added that it appears as if there was some sort of, quote, pressure tactic being used. An official from Seoul's presidential office had also said Monday that an ambassador's role is to act as a bridge between two countries, and that if that bridge does not conduct its role properly, it can harm the national benefits of both countries. 
The official also told reporters that under Article 41 of the Vienna Convention, diplomats must respect the laws of the receiving state, and that it's also their duty not to interfere in the internal affairs of that state. It's rare for South Korea's top office to openly criticize an ambassador from a particular country, meaning that the government is taking the situation seriously. In response, the Chinese foreign ministry simply said it's the ambassador's job to meet and communicate with a wide range of officials in order to boost its relations with South Korea. All this diplomatic controversy comes as the Chinese ambassador has said last week that South Korea was entirely to blame for the many difficulties in bilateral relations, and that Seoul will certainly regret it later. Some are betting that the United States will win and China will lose, but clearly this is a misjudgment. As both sides continue to exchange harsh comments, it appears that it'll take some time before the two countries find a way to repair ties. The United States plans to rejoin UNESCO from July this year, ending a lengthy dispute that saw Washington end its membership in 2018. Director General Audrey Azoulay told UNESCO representatives in Paris that the U.S. intends to renew its membership, describing the move as a strong act of confidence in UNESCO in multilateralism. True to its promise of reversing Donald Trump's policies, the Biden administration says it plans for the United States to rejoin UNESCO after five years of absence. UNESCO is doing well, and it will do even better with the return of the United States. Because the aim of multilateralism is to welcome all nations, large and small. U.S. officials say the decision was motivated by the concern that Beijing is filling the gap left by Washington in UNESCO policymaking, with Secretary of State Antony Blinken saying UNESCO is letting China write the rules on artificial intelligence. Beijing said it would not oppose the move, but reminded Washington to pay back more than $600 million in dues. We hope that UNESCO follows the rules and the regulations of the organization and urges the U.S to pay the arrears of its assessed contribution and the time pay its assessed contribution in full. A founding member of UNESCO, the United States was the biggest contributor to UNESCO's budget until 2011, when the body admitted Palestine as a member state, triggering an end to U.S. contributions. The Trump administration then decided in 2017 to withdraw from the agency altogether, citing anti-Israel bias. The country previously pulled out of UNESCO in 1984 as it viewed the agency as corrupt and used to advance Soviet interests, rejoining in 2003 under the Bush administration. Its second reinstatement will be put to vote by its 193 member states in July, where the U.S. will need to secure the majority. The violence in Sudan continues. Saudi Arabia and the United States condemn the resumption of violence in Sudan after 24-hour truce between the warring parties expired, calling for immediate ceasefire and talks. Violent clashes between Sudanese armed forces and the rival rapid support forces resumed in Sudan's capital Khartoum and surrounding areas shortly after the 24-hour ceasefire mediated by Saudi Arabia and the U.S. ended. Fierce fighting concentrated in south and east of Khartoum as well as northern Omdurman, where both sides used artillery and other heavy weapons to secure control of several military bases and important bridges. The fighting had spread to residential areas with at least two civilians being killed and a dozen being injured. Saudi Arabia and the U.S. issued a joint statement condemning the resumption of violence and calling for an immediate end to the fighting. In a joint statement, Saudi Arabia and the U.S. said Sudan's warring parties demonstrated effective command and control over their forces, resulting in reduced fighting throughout Sudan that enabled delivery of vital humanitarian assistance during the ceasefire. However, the two radiating countries said they were deeply disappointed by the immediate resumption of intense violence, stressing that there is no acceptable military solution to the conflict, according to the statement. The statement also indicated that Saudi Arabia and U.S. stand ready to reconvene formal talks in Jeddah, but only once the warring parties demonstrate their commitment to upholding their obligations under the Jeddah Declaration to protect the civilians of Sudan. Sudan descended into chaos after fighting erupted in mid-April. Sudan's army and RSF signed the Jeddah Declaration on May 11th in the Saudi port of Jeddah with the aim of providing humanitarian assistance. The two sides had agreed to a 24-hour cessation of hostilities which began on the 10th of June. Despite sporadic exchanges of fire in several parts of Sudan, the weekend marked the calmest day since the conflict began as sounds of shelling and airstrikes disappeared and life was restored. 
We're going into a short commercial break now. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. Now, initial forensic work got underway to try and exhume the bodies of 128 victims of late dictator Francisco Franco's forces, who are among tens of thousands of people buried anonymously in wooden boxes underground in a mausoleum. Forensic scientists have begun the exhumation of 128 victims of the Spanish Civil War. Their bodies will be exhumed from the former mausoleum of General Francisco Franco just outside of Madrid. The war took place from 1936 to 1939, the beginning of Franco's four-decade dictatorship. Spain transitioned to democracy following Franco's death in 1975. The operation is the first involving people whose bodies were moved from other parts of Spain after the war and reburied without their family's consent in a monument built by Franco. As the exhumation takes place, the country is heating up for a divisive early election. It's likely to make Franco's dictatorship a topic of passionate discussion as socialist Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez seeks re-election. The remains of some 34,000 people, many of them victims of Franco's regime, are buried anonymously in the crypt of the Basilica, which is carved into a mountainside northwest of Madrid. Relatives have been fighting for years to give their loved ones a burial under their names and near their families. Passing a law that makes it possible for relatives to identify victims who are buried in about 2,400 unmarked mass graves around Spain was one of the first policies implemented by Sanchez when he came to power in 2018. The rival Conservative People's Party has opposed the so-called Law on Democratic Memory and vowed to repeal it if it wins power in the July 23rd vote. The process of identifying the remains could take weeks or months meaning the results will probably be published after the election. Kyiv and its Western allies will look to discuss later this week the details of a potential fighter jet coalition, the training of Ukrainian pilots and the opening of repair hubs for Western military equipment. They also renewed their pledge to start training Ukrainian pilots, especially on F-16 fighter jets, and discuss the supply of aircrafts. Ukrainian pilots could begin training to fly U.S. manufactured F-16 fighter jets as soon as this summer, according to the Dutch defense minister. Kaiser Olengren spoke in an interview. We have to look at uh, what, what, what capabilities do, do they already have? How is their English language? Uh, what, what group can we start with? On what level are they actually? So yes, uh, this summer is our ambition uh, and we'll see if that's realistic. NATO allies the Netherlands and Denmark are leading an international coalition to train pilots, support staff and ultimately supply F-16s to Ukraine, though a final decision on supplying the jets to Kyiv has not yet been made, Olengren said. The thing is uh, that it is, it is a very strong uh, weapon system, it's a very strong uh, capability, but it's not going to be available uh, anytime soon. Uh, and uh, President Zelensky, of course, knows that. The aim would be to have the training program fully operational within six months. Two sources speaking on condition of anonymity told the training would begin with two groups of 12 experienced Ukrainian pilots. Certainly master arm. This Dutch pilot is part of the team being assembled to train the Ukrainians. Flying wise, well technically, I mean, if you're a pilot, this is also just an airplane. But to fly a fighter jet uh, and to transition to an F-16, which for them would mean like different technology, different design concepts. A U.S. official speaking on condition of anonymity said training an experienced Ukrainian pilot on the basics could take as little as four months. We have some good news for you. A South Korean research team has deployed a type of technology that effectively removes fine dust in subway stations. It's a filter-free air purifier that can process a lot of air at once and is expected to be effective in various public spaces as well. On days fine dust levels are high outside, they get worse in subway stations. This is because the constant flow of outside air adds to the dust from wear on the tracks and natural ventilation is limited. 
Last year, the average concentration levels of ultrafine dust at subway platforms nationwide were 29 micrograms per cubic meter, the highest among public facilities. Purifying air in closed spaces can be done quickly, but special equipment is required at places like underground stations because there are many contributing factors. A South Korean research team has developed something that can purify more air at once by actually removing the filter of an air purifier. Negative electrons that come out of the electrode at the top of the purifier stick to the fine dust floating in the air. This makes the fine dust negative and stick to the bottom of the purifier, which is then positively charged and only clean air flows through the purifier. Unlike conventional methods, filters don't block the airflow of the newly developed purifier, so it can clean 1.5 times more air in the same amount of time. Filters also deteriorate as fine dust accumulates, so they need replacing, but this technology maintains its performance of removing more than 90% of fine dust. The research team says the new technology can be applied to existing air purifiers by only improving the filter, so it's cost-effective. It costs nearly 4,000 U.S. dollars per year to replace filters per station. So for 500 stations, this saves $1.9 million. The research team applied this technology at Taejeon's Yusong Spa subway station. They also plan to install it in tunnels with running trains to check changes in air quality. The new technology is expected to be used in public facilities such as movie theaters and large restaurants to improve air quality. It's been a bumpy few years for the Golden Globe Awards and the whole show has been sold off to a new buyer for a fresh start. Dick Clark Productions acquired the Golden Globes, resulting in the dissolution of the non-profit Hollywood Foreign Press Association after years of controversy. The Golden Globe Awards were sold to a new owner on Monday. And one of the first things they plan to do is shut down the group behind the show, the embattled Hollywood Foreign Press Association. That's the voting group that was under fire from the rest of Hollywood over ethical failures and a lack of diversity. It was made up of entertainment journalists from overseas. Members had been accused of making racist and sexist remarks as well as soliciting favors from studios. And an LA Times investigation in 2021 revealed it had no black members in its ranks. NBC dropped broadcast of the show last year even after the group promised to make changes and recruit more black members. Under the New Deal, Dick Clark Productions will continue to manage the awards and focus on building the Globe's global brand. The chairman of Eldridge Industries, a co-owner of Dick Clark, intends to install a yet-to-be-named for-profit entity to run the Golden Globes. Hollywood Foreign Press members will reportedly become employees of the new entity, and current voters will be able to vote in the 2024 awards ceremony. NBC aired the Globes again in 2023 but no network has yet signed up to run the 2024 ceremony. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The driver in an Australian bus crash that killed 10 passengers was granted bail today after being charged with dangerous and negligent driving. The bus accident was the country's deadliest in three decades. Mourners gathered outside from Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi's residence in Accor following his death yesterday. People left floral tributes, flags, scarves and banners outside the media of Naples Villa, thanking him for his contributions to both Italian politics and sport. The United Nations Labour Agency held a high-level panel themed social justice for all and in child labour as a parallel session of the International Labour Conference. The discussion focused on the line between social justice and the elimination of child labour. More than 3,000 South Korean fishermen gathered near the parliamentary building in Seoul to protest Japan's planned discharge of radioactive wastewater from its Fukushima nuclear power plant in the Pacific Ocean. The protesters urged the Japanese government to come up with a long-term solution rather than dumping the radioactive water in the Pacific Ocean. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas arrived in Beijing today for a four-day state visit. The Chinese foreign minister stated that Abbas is the first ever the head of state hosted by China this year.
And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we wrap up with landmarks in South Korea's capital, illuminating K-pop sensation BTS's signature color purple to mark the 10th anniversary of the boy band's debut. Stay safe and have a good night.